Thank you, Dr. Levy. Let me um, particularly thank Mr. Schaefer for his hands-on experience uh, and the testimony that he brought here. I'll share with you that um, a friend who's a Rhode Island fishing captain has uh, said to me, a guy who started on his grandfather's boat, uh, Sheldon, <coughs> this is not my grandfather's ocean anymore. Things are getting weird out there. And that seems to align very much with your experience in Maine. We too are seeing black sea bass moving up through uh, Rhode Island waters without uh, appropriate uh, adjustment in the fishing regulations to uh, track that move. We've seen our lobster fishery essentially disappear. We used to have a fishery for something called winter flounder. Uh, that is gone. It's now bycatch. Um, so your stories of what is happening in Maine are true for us in Rhode Island as well. I'd also add that I made a trip to Florida to look at uh, climate issues down there uh, some time ago and met with the mayor, Republican mayor, of Monroe County, which is the southernmost county, I believe, in Florida. And I asked her about the reefs. And she said, they're beautiful, unless you were here 10 years ago. So we are seeing these dramatic changes, and I just wanted to validate your experience with the experience that uh, I've encountered from people who are actually directly involved. Um, Dr. Dutton, the, in Rhode Island, we've got a thing called storm tools. It's a very, very well-developed uh, uh, storm coastal flooding risk assessment tool run by the Coastal Resources Management Council, our uh, CZMA agency. Uh, it operates off of NOAA data. Um, but it sounds like it's your testimony that the averaging effect, the mean that we look at in uh, sea level rise predictions could be dramatically off by very considerable uh, feet of sea level rise and that we will find that out fairly suddenly. Is that accurate and would you elaborate? Yes, that is accurate. So part of my testimony is that if we re rely on this central estimate, we will most likely be underestimating what will actually happen. That's for a couple different reasons. Part of it is the nature that the reports of the guidance that is provided is done by consensus. So what can we all in this room as scientists agree upon how much sea level is going to rise? And no one wants to be, seem like an alarmist, right, which is a term that Senator Johnson uh, brought up a few minutes ago. Say, well, this is what we're really certain it's going to rise this much. But we know there are these tipping points there. It's more a question of when rather than if. You're, if we keep warming the oceans, we will reach those tipping points. But because the models are not very good yet at telling us exactly when that is going to happen, it's hard for us to fold that in, and so we have less certainty. So it doesn't fall within that central estimate. So this is a fundamental problem in the way this uh, information is communicated and then implemented, and then risk is assessed, because the economists are going to be using those central estimates that we provide, right, uh, which, which indeed are underestimates. Uh, so that hopefully explains your question. And if you uh, take it to the shore, uh, Dr. Fraser, um, you said that there is considerable uncertainty as to how the large-scale predictions of sea level rise um, can be drilled down to what you called local insights. Um, that uncertainty creates a fairly significant problem for the insurance industry, doesn't it? So I'm an, an ecologist or an ecosystem scientist, and um, I just want to preface my comment here by saying that, you know, what my goal is is to provide the science that allows people to um, evaluate risk, you know, and that's the magnitude of the threat, yep. right, and the probability that it will occur. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that then, but I do extend my sympathies to Florida on what is going on <laughs> down there in the insurance markets, which seem to be very distressed. Um, and having lived through a couple of insurance crises in Rhode Island, I see the early signs of the, the market swirling the drain. 
Um, Dr. Samela, what do you think are the uh, climate tipping points or the climate risks that are most likely to do serious damage to the fisheries supply chain and how? In, 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 yeah, is it okay? Yeah. In my written report, I talk about the four, what I call them, the deadly quartet, the deadly four. And, and, and this has been mentioned by my colleagues here. The first is that the warming is taking place. Because of the warming, fish, like every living thing, when the conditions are difficult, you try to move, right? Those that can move, move with the cool water, and we see that happening. And those that can't perish. And we're seeing the more the temperature rises, the more we're going to get closer to a tipping point. And in some places, we're actually seeing some of these things happen, where fish that were plentiful are gone, partly because of climate change, plus overfishing the two and pollution, right? So you have that. The second thing is acidification. And this worries me a lot, ocean acidification. Because you see, the fish are moving towards the poles. And the Arctic is actually known to be the hotspot for ocean acidification because of all the changes that are happening. So here is fish moving from southern Florida because it's hot to the Arctic. And then they get to the Arctic, they mean acidification. So from hot boiling water to acidic water, just think about that. And then you have deoxygenation. The processes are actually reducing the oxygen in the ocean. And the Pacific coast is a hot spot of that. So we face that. No oxygen, no life, right? This is applies to fish too. Finally, you have the sea level rise, which really knocks off so much. So this all pushes us towards a tipping point. I'll turn to uh, Senator Johnson, but I'd add just one observation, because I've been looking at this for a long time. Um, it was maybe most of a decade ago that scientists went out into the waters off the Pacific Northwest, yeah. and they looked at the pteropod, yeah. which is a tiny snail that swims and operates in the pelagic environment. Um, and it is a very, very important food source yeah. for the ocean food chain. Mm. Um, and they, in their sampling, I think found that 50% of the pteropods had exhibited uh, what they called moderate to severe shell damage mm -hmm. from the acidification yeah. out there. And of course, if you take a foundational part of the fishery's food chain and it collapses because the little creature can't make a shell properly any longer and therefore can't survive in that acidified environment, then the whole rest of the, I think uh, Dr. Dutton would probably call it trophic uh, cascade falls down as well. So uh, just another point of data.